dependent origination to momentary arising. In Ajahn Buddhadasa's book on dependent origination, he emphasizes that his approach has been on Patita Samuppada as working in the moment rather than in terms of past, present, and future lives. When you contemplate, when you practice, you realize that that's the only way it could ever be. This is because we're working with the mind itself. When we're considering the birth of a human body, we're not commenting on the birth of our own bodies, but recognizing mentally that these bodies were born. Then we note in reflection that mental consciousness arises and ceases, so that whole sequence of dependent origination arises and ceases in a moment. The arising and the cessation from avicca are momentary. It's not a kind of permanent avicca. It would be a mistaken view to assume that everything began with avicca and will all cease sometime in the future. In this sense, avicca means not understanding the Four Noble Truths. When there is understanding of suffering, origin, cessation, and path, things are no longer affected by avicca. We see the perceptions with avicca. Perceptions are conventional reality, no longer me and mine. For example, when there is avicca, I can say, I am Ajahn Sumedho. That's a conventional reality, still a perception, but it's no longer viewed from avicca. It's merely a convention we use, so there's nothing more to it than that. It is as it is. When we reach the cessation of ignorance, at that moment, all the rest of the sequence ceases. It's not that one ceases and then another ceases. When there's Ouija, suffering ceases. In any moment, when there is true mindfulness and wisdom, there's no suffering. Suffering has ceased. When you contemplate the cessation of desire, the cessation of grasping, upadana, there is a cessation of becoming, the cessation of rebirth and suffering. When things cease, when everything ceases, there's peace, there's knowing, serenity, emptiness, not self. These are the words, the concepts describing cessation. When I practice in this way, I find it's very difficult to find any suffering. I realize there isn't any suffering except in a heedless moment, when one gets carried away with something. So because of heedlessness, lack of attention and forgetting, we get caught in habitual comic mind stuff. But when we realize we've been heedless, we can let it cease. We can let it go. There's the letting go, the abiding in emptiness. No longer are there the strong impulses to grasp, the fascination and glamour of the sensory world have been penetrated. No longer is there anything to grasp. One can still experience and see the way things are without grasping them. There's nobody grasping anything. There can still be feeling seeing and hearing, taste and touch, but they're no longer created into a person, me and mine. For me, the important insight is just how momentary consciousness is. The tendency is to perceive consciousness as a long-term thing, being awake and conscious as a permanent state of being, rather than a moment. And yet when jnana is always described as a moment, a flashing moment, an instant. So rather than assume that a is a continuous process from the birth out of our bodies, we can see that at any moment there can be Ouija, and the whole thing just ceases. The cessation of that whole mass of suffering can be realized. It's gone. Where is it? To practice this way is to keep examining things so that everything is seen exactly for what it is. Everything is only what it is in the moment. When we see that beauty is just beauty in the moment, 
Ugliness is just that in the moment. There's no attempt to solidify it or prolong it in any way because things are just what they are. One is increasingly aware of the formulas or nebulous as just what it is rather than something that's overlooked, dismissed, or misinterpreted. The problem of perception is that it tends to limit us just to being conscious of certain points. We tend to be conscious at certain designated points, and the natural change and flux and flow are not really noticed. One is only conscious at A, B, C, D, E, F, G. The points between A and B are never really noticed, because one is only really conscious at the designated points of perception. That's why when the mind is opened with Ouija and is receptive, Dhamma reveals itself. There's a kind of revelation. The empty mind in the state of wonder allows truth to be revealed, but no longer through perception. This is where it is ineffable truth. Words fail us, and it's impossible to put it into any perceptions or concepts. Maybe now you're beginning to appreciate the emphasis the Buddha made. I teach only two things. There's suffering and there's the end of suffering. If you have just that insight into understanding suffering and then realize the end of suffering, you're liberated from ignorance. If you attempt to speculate on what it's like, you could call it Nibbana, the highest happiness. But highest happiness is not quite it either. To expect the highest happiness sounds like expecting to get high, floating in the air, reaching Nibbana and floating up to the ceiling. But the way is one of realization, mindfulness and realization. The Eightfold Path is development, bhavana, to develop that path to right understanding. More and more we realize the emptiness, the not-self, the freedom from not being attached to anything, which affects what we say, what we do, how we live in the society we're in by increasing the sense of serenity and calm. That word Nibbana is generally defined as non-attachment to the five khandhas, which means no longer experiencing a sense of a self with regard to the body and mind, rupa, vedana, sanya, sankara, vijnana, we no longer contemplate the five khandhas with a Ouija, but with Ouija. We see that they're all impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self. Nibbana is the realization of non-attachment, wherein the self-view ceases. The body's still breathing, so it doesn't dissolve into thin air, but the mistaken identity that I am the body dissolves. The mistaken identification with Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, Vijnana, all that ceases. The self dissolves. You can't find anybody. You can't find yourself because you are yourself. In the traditional view of dependent origination occurring over the span of three lives, the five khandhas are seen as a kind of permanent form from birth. The body, feelings, perceptions, mind formations, and consciousness are considered as being continuous from birth. But that's an assumption we make, and the reflection of momentary arising points to the mind itself. The body isn't a person anyway. It's not me and mine, never was, never will be. There's only the perception of it as me and mine the belief that I was born. I've got a birth certificate to prove that this body was born. We carry birth certificates in our mind. We carry around the whole history, the memories and so forth of our lives, giving us a sense of a continuity of a person from birth to the present moment. But examination of perception alone shows that perception arises and ceases. This perception of me as a permanent personality is just a moment. 
it arises and ceases. Consciousness, too, is just momentary and conveys the attractive, repulsive, and neutral qualities of the conditioned realm. When one sees that clearly, there's no longer any interest in that attachment and in seeking for happiness, trying to be reborn into happiness or beauty, pleasure, safety, or security. Rebirth is a grasping of the conditioned realm, so we let that go. The five khandhas are still the five khandhas, but they're seen for what they are, as impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self. So this reflection on the truth of the way it is, is very direct, very clear. From the confused, amorphous, nebulous, insecure, unstable, uncertain, to the certain, whatever it is, we're no longer choosing which we prefer, we're just noting that whatever arises ceases. As you realize this through your practice, a lot of the vagueness and fuzziness of your mind are seen for exactly what they are. Confusion is confusion, just that, it's a dhamma. Confusion is just confusion in the moment, it's not permanent or the self. So what before was a problem or something deluding us is transformed into a dhamma. The transformation is not through changing the condition, but through changing the attitude from ignorance to clarity. People say, well, all this is very well, but what about love and compassion? The block for all that is desire. Love is no problem once there's no delusion. Once there's no self, there's nothing to hinder, block off, or prevent love. But as long as there is self-illusion, love is just an idea that we long for, but always feel disappointed with because the self is getting in the way. The self-view is always blinding us, making us forget, and deluding us that there isn't any love. We feel alienated, lonely and lost because there doesn't seem to be any love, so we blame somebody else. Or maybe we blame ourselves for not being lovable, or we become cynics. But the Buddha pointed to this and asked what the real problem was. It's the illusion of a self its attachment to that perception that affects consciousness and everything else. So we're always creating separations and dissatisfaction and identifying with that which is not ourselves. Once we're free from that illusion, love is ever present. It's just that we can't see it or enjoy it when we're blinded by our desires and fears. As you understand this more and more, your faith increases, and there's a willingness to give up everything. There's a real zest, a joy in being with the way things are.